Hi all. Let's continue our look at Lasker. When we saw the Capablanca game, uh, Lasker was getting quite uh, on a bit. It was about more than 60 years old, may maybe 70 or something. Between 60 and 70. Someone correct me on that. Anyway, this is right at the start of his career. Um, it was against Johann Hermann ba Bauer. Bayer. It was played in Amsterdam, 1889. And apparently... You know, I checked this out. It's even got a wiki page. This game, it's incredibly famous apparently in, a, in for for the double bishop sacrifice that happened. So if you're looking to sack both your bishops, this is the game to have a look at first. <laughs> apparently, uh, the sacrificial pa uh, pattern, according to wiki, uh, was echoed in a number of games, notably uh, Nimzovich Tarash, St. Petersburg, 1914. Um, so, uh, Miles Brown, Lucerne, uh, 1982, and Polgar Karpov, 7th se Essence Tournaments in 2003. So, right at the beginning of his career, let's have a look at it. And it's a bit hyper-modern-ish, because F4 is, is continued uh, later with uh, Fincetto in this bishop. So, F4, D5, so we've got Nimzo-ish Larsen attack, as it will be known today, when you combine this Fincetto with an early F4, without blocking in this knight. Okay, now sometimes in Blitz, actually, I've uh, played G3 and Bishop G2, but actually, you know, this Bishop could also be usefully posted here. I'm not sure that Black maybe could, could have exploited that in this game, but it's an interesting configuration of pieces to put the Bishop there on D3. You know, can Black potentially, you know, threaten like Knight C6 to B4 or C5, C4 at some point? Maybe as a pawn sack. You know, is there some controversy of Bishop D3 here? But uh, b6 was played. White's got a bit of a, a clamp on the dark squares, um, that e5 square in particular. Okay, so knight c3. Now this is a bit of an odd move. You see, this is very good actually. Um, e even in my, my current games at the moment, I'm sometimes you know playing bishop e2, then weakening myself even further with d3. And we saw Nimzo play it rather badly against Yuva uh, with something like that, because it ends up weakening a lot more squares. By playing knight c3 with this little hopping manoeuvre, there's less pawns that have been moved. You're still sticking uh, to this um, kind of structure, uh, this structure here, so without it being mo touched. So you just want to keep your bind on the dark squares. And maybe this knight's an attacking knight from g3 in any way. So you can eye this bishop you know, on that diagonal and this bishop on that diagonal. Which we're seeing a lot of recently in in like the Nezhmetsov games as well. So Bishop B7, Knight F3, Knight BD7. Okay. So what is what is Black doing? That's just developing pieces. Seemingly, this, uh, seemingly without a coherent plan, though. There's there's some magic, some X factor missing from Black. A lack of inspiration. Is is he uh, the sort of player you really want to punish? You know, with a brilliant combination. Yes, I would say so. So uh, White Castles. Black castles. Okay, but how to arrange an attack against the Black King now? Well, knight e2, this nice hopping maneuver to g3. So after queen c7, let's start using that e5 square as a basis for our kingside attack. Knight e5. Let's not worry about maybe um, knight takes e5. There's at least two options, fe or bishop e5 if knight takes e5. Um, Black chose bishop, sorry, Lasker chose after knight takes e5, bishop takes e5. Okay, queen c6. So black's setting up a potential battery on g2 if d4 is going to be allowed. Uh, so what does white want to do about that? d4 or c4, is that a latent threat as well? Maybe kick the bishop finally, try and punish that bishop on d3? Well, actually, um, Nasca plays uh, uh, a defensive move in, in, two, in both those respects next. Queen e2, so defending g2. And also defending against c4, the bishop can't be trapped at the moment. If there was a6, b5, then c4 will be a threat to, to, to win that bishop. a6, in fact, comes comes along now. Maybe black does buy that, you know, tasty idea, swallow this bishop with c4. So knight h5, though, now he's getting attacked by these, these two guys. Is this going to be enough? Can this rook also swing into the attack at some point? That's the question. f4, you know, not only putting a bit of uh, restraints and grip on the dark squares, it always offers that convenience of the standards, you know, rook f3, h3, and then make the opponent an h7 plan. So knight takes h5. And now here, instead of the routine move, Queen takes h5. I wonder if you can spot Lasker's next move if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, time's up. 
Okay, here's the brilliant double bishop sacrifice. Yes, we've arrived at that point in this game. So, off we go with bishop takes h7. See, there's a point to stick in the bishop on d3. It's not just a tactical liability to b5 and c4. So, black takes, white takes check, king g8, and now make that king even more naked and exposed and vulnerable. Sack the other bishop. Bishop takes g7. Yes! The bishop, the, so where is black's king safety? The queens are all, the bishop and queen over here, okay, they're pointing at g2, but you know, black hasn't played d4 yet. The rook's still on a8, you know, this rook can still swing in. In, in fact, we're going to use this rook now, queen g4 check. So the king can't make a run for it with king f6, queen g5 would be embarrassing. There's no escape square anywhere on e7, the bishop's blocking the escape routes. So the king is forced onto that h file, king h7. And now we can come in with the artillery, the heavy artillery, rook f3, threatening rook h3 mating. Unfortunately, the black queen isn't on c7, otherwise, you know, maybe, uh, you know, bishop h4 would have been uh, a defense. Even, even then, no, it would need more than, <laughs> more than the queen defending on d8. So th this is quite a vicious g and h file attack, basically. So, so the black king uh, is in dire straits. So what can happen? Okay, black finds a resource to defend by offering his queen up to avoid getting mated straight away. So this is on move 19, black plays e5, knowing he's going to lose his queen. So rook h3 check. But remember, he's also gobbled up two bishops anyway, so he's got a point. If he can survive, you know, it would be rook and two bishops, which isn't bad. But uh, let's see the resulting position. So rook h6, king takes h6. And now unfortunately, I don't know if this was all well calculated, uh, by by Lasker, but you know these two bishops are actually not protected by anything, so they represent a tactical liability. So once you see a tactical liability in the position, maybe far off, you know this would have been seen. You know there's there's a uh, there's a problem. There's potential for a double attack, especially double attacks eat up you know unprotected pieces. So queen d7, nice double attack on both bishops. So both bishops been sacrificed nicely earlier and now both bishops of the opponent just attacked with a nice fork with queen d7. So bishop f6, so bit of material, more material. Material situation not looking too bad now. Okay, white slightly up in material in fact. King g7 and still has got the ability to switch a rook in potentially. So rook f1, the other rook's going to come in via f3, then attack the black king. Okay, rook ab8, Queen d7, get the queen involved again on the g and h files. Another g and h file party coming up. So queen g4, f takes e. In fact, forget moving the rook, let's just use it on the f file against f7, maybe. So e6 hitting f7. Now queen g6, again putting more pressure on f7. How is black defending f7? Okay, with f6, it's not adequate now. Let's just blow the black king apart when more material. Rook takes f6 was played. This has been a fantastic game by Lasker. Um, the vision, you know, to get the material back, you know, after the queen sack was offered. And now, you know, this position, check here, is actually, you know, this, this bishop, sorry, this rook is unfortunately not protected. So there it goes. Now, queen takes b7. Big material advantage. And the rest is just, you know, easy. D3, queen takes d3, in fact, was played. The king and pawn ending would be absolutely trivial. Black resigned. So it is a classic game. If you want to sacrifice both bishops, you know, first of all, point them at the opponent's king, uh, then use e5 basically, and then take your opportunity for a bishop takes h7 check. So let's have a look at that again. So f4. So it was a Nimzo Larsen attack before Nimzo kind of popularized it, maybe. So maybe he was studying um, Lasker's early games. Or maybe Tarish's games. Um, so, so knight bd7, and um, after castles, so so the knight hops to g3, and then plays a role in, in removing one of Black's king defenders, actually, with this with this knight h5. So stripping away Black's defense, you know, the process has really started here, getting rid of, uh, t you know, defend defenders. So there's you know less defenders, there's only the bishop there. So the other bishop sacks itself, and then we get this lovely rook and queen coordination, and we've also got this tactical liability emerging after black offers the queen. These these bishops can be forked. 
So white ends up starting to get material edge. F7 is a major, major issue on the F file now. So F7 and then a lovely exchange sack to exploit this unprotected rook on B7. Wonderful game. And lovely little elegant finish as well. Please leave any comments or questions on YouTube. For the evolution of style, I think it just shows how Lasker immediately at the start of his career was dangerous attacking tactical could co calculate very very well through through all these sacrifices if he did indeed anticipate things like queen d7 very early on thanks very much